All right, so let's look at this discussion. Okay, so it ask us to use this diagram. Okay, so this is a short run aggregate supply, aggregate demand. In the middle, this is long run aggregate supply. So use this diagram to understand or illustrate economic growth. Okay. And they assume so AD doesn't change over time. Okay. So long run economic growth typically caused by technology. Technology change. Right? So that essentially just says okay, because uh, better technology. So this is going to shift to the left hand side. Right? So we're going to shift to here essentially, basically. Right? In the meantime, so you have short run aggregate supply is going to shift to the right. So this is just jointly moved to the right hand side. Right? And because of long run economic growth, you can see so you have you have higher Y, but you have lower P. Okay? Price decline and output increase. All right. So now let's look at macroeconomic policy. From the discussion we have so far, so the economy is able to self-create itself in the long run. Right? So this self-correcting is explained by the two cases we discussed. Either is a positive demand or negative demand. Right? So in either case, you can see, so that's going to put some pressure on the labor market. Right? So if it's a positive demand shock, price will increase, uh, output increase. But then, so immediate means unemployment is going to decline. So eventually, the so wage will increase. If it's a negative demand shock, price will decline. Why decline? Uh, unemployment rate is going to increase eventually. So the wage will adjust downward. So in either case, so that's going to lead to the short run aggregate supply to adjust until we produce it our long run aggregate supply. Right. So clearly, yes, the market can self-correct itself, but the problem is it is going to take a while. And the most economists think it is going to take a decade or longer. All right. So that is why we need some stabilization policy. Okay, so this stabilization essentially is going to is going to design to to overcome the fluctuation. Okay. Where's the fluctuation shows up? Let's just look at positive demand shock. So you can see the price is increasing, right? And unemployment decline, wage eventually increase. Right? So this fluctuation is represented by the change in price level and the wage and unemployment. Right? So the stabilization policy will use current policy to reduce to reduce the severity of recession meaning to reduce the uh, unimportant rate change or re reduce uh, uh, price adjustment right on the other hand so we also want to use this stabilization policy to to contain the excessively strong expansion Right, so because this strong expansion eventually leads to a higher price, or eventually leads to, leads to inflation in the long run. Right, so neither is desirable. Right, so that's why we want to have some stabilization policy. Right? And here, so this is a quote we have seen earlier. In the long run, this long run is a misleading guide to current affair. In the long run, we are all dead. So this essentially just reflects the long adjustment. This long adjustment period that we just discussed. So during this long adjustment period, we have discussed the economy is going to suffer in terms of either inflation or a unemployment rate, high unemployment rate, or a decline in wage, right? So neither is desirable, right? So that is why the modern macroeconomics advocate for 
government intervention okay, to stabilize the economy as a response to either a positive shock or a negative shock. Right. And so we can look at very long-term horizon to see whether the macroeconomics helps to stabilize our economy. Okay. So if we look at 1890 to 2013, unemployment rate in the United States. Okay. So overall, it fluctuates. But what we can see is, so this fluctuation becomes milder, right? particularly after 1980, right? except this uh, financial crisis. So now let's see so how, how uh, we are going to respond or how the government is going to respond, right? And so this is particularly um, challenging. So when there is a supply shock or negative supply shock, right? Because so far we only talk about a demand shock. Now we may want to look at what happened if there's a supply shock. So if there is a negative supply shock, so that's going to pose a policy dilemma. First, just remind yourself, let's just use say, this curved corner to draw, to draw a curve to understand what happened if there's a negative supply shock. Okay. So if we have a negative supply shock and then the supply curve shift to the left, and now we are here compared to the original equilibrium. So with a negative supply shock, we enter a stagflation, right? In the sense, so you have a recessionary gap or you produce less than you potentially can produce. And you have inflation. In a sense, the price increase. Okay, right, so yes, so we are here, right? So we have a, a negative uh, supply shock. Okay, uh, so now what the government can do to stabilize, right? So if the government wants to stabilize the output, and then they must lift up demand, okay? So, but however, if we lift up the demand, okay, so you're going to raise the inflation even further, right? So this is the first option, to stabilize aggregate output. So that's going to increase aggregate demand. This will lead to inflation one step further, okay? On the other hand, so if we want to stabilize price, and then so we may decrease the supply, sorry, decrease demand, it's because this one goes here. Right? But that is going to lead to a wider, so you can, here, so you can see, so then it leads to a, a more severe output. So you can see if there's a negative supply shock, so the choice or the challenging is very significant. Right. Uh, I guess I pretty much finish uh, the discussion here. Uh, we, let's see, so right. So uh, I can quickly summarize what we have learned. In this in this chapter, and now we are ready for we are ready for our um, meter. So again, so Wednesday, so I'm going to give you a uh, review for the uh, for the meter, right? So let me just use uh, use one slide to summarize what we have learned.
And then, so we are ready for our uh, review. Maybe you this slide, okay? So I'm going to use these slides as a quick review for what we discuss in this chapter, right? So in this chapter, so we bring supply and demand all together. And then we relax the assumption that price are given. Okay? And so in this chapter, so the price will determine in equilibrium, right? And where we start, we start with aggregate demand. But so where does this aggregate demand curve coming from? Actually coming from the um, income expenditure model we discussed in previous chapter. So what is the income expenditure uh, model? So this is, this is income or Y, this is expenditure, right? And so you have this line, right? So this line essentially reflects, so higher income leads to larger expenditure, right? And so the 45 degree line cross with this aggregate expenditure line, so that's going to determine equilibrium income or equilibrium expenditure. So this is for a given price. And so in previous chapter, price are given. Okay? So now if we adjust the price, say for example, price decrease. And the price decreases, the entire curve is going to shift up. So now we are going to see a new, new cross with 45 degree line. Right? So basically, it says if price declines, you can see the out uh, the the expenditure will increase, right? So that is going to give us the downward slope aggregate demand curve, price total expenditure, right? So price decline, like price decline, and then the aggregate demand, sorry, aggregate expenditure is going to increase. So that's going to lead to a total aggregate expenditure increase. Okay, so that's give us this aggregate demand curve. Okay. And then next we look at aggregate supply. Okay. So short run aggregate supply just tells us if price increase, so eventually output will increase. Okay. So what is the link between these two? So that's through the sticky wage, right? So sticky wage is going to increase the profit. Let's use pi. Pi equal to price of the goods you sell minus the cost and the minus wage, right? So if there's inflation, this is going to increase. This is going to increase, but this is going to this one is going to stay the same. So that explains so why higher price or high inflation leads to higher profit. But higher profit gives the firms the incentive to expand. So that's why higher price leads to higher goods supply. Right? Or in other words, why the short run accurate supply curve is upward slope trend. Okay? So now if these two, if these two cross each other, we enter the short run equilibrium. Okay, we should enter a short run equilibrium. And then, so what happened in the long run? Long run is going to be determined by stuff other than price. Because in the long run, so the economy is flexible enough or have enough time to adjust with price change. So in the long run, what the economy can produce we are relies on technology. We are relies on capital. We are relies on labor, employment. Okay, so this employment is, is a natural rate of employment. This is in the long run. Now, we are ready to look at what happens if there's a shock to the economy, or in other words, so we we are ready to look at the fluctuation, the cause of the fluctuation. Right? Or in some sense, this is essentially the business cycle. Okay. So basically there are four possible shocks. Right? So either it's a positive demand or negative demand. Okay. So if it is a positive demand and a demand curve shift to the left hand side, okay. and so because this happens in the short run, so the aggregate supply 
may not have time to adjust yet. So that's why, that's why the equilibrium is going to move from here to here. Uh, the outcome, so you have a expansionary, expansionary shock or inflationary gap. Right? So essentially, we produce more than we potentially can produce. So this is the initial response. Now, give the economy some time. So after this initial positive demand shock, price will increase. So the price is higher than the PE. Price increase, right? But this price increase leads to unemployment rate to drop, right? And why does unemployment rate drop? Largely because of the sticky wage. Right, so higher price, but wage are sticky, and then profit per unit will increase, and then firm has incentive to expand, and then the expansion in and the business will lead to a stronger hiring. So the unemployment will drop. Now the unemployment rate declines, so that is going to make the worker becomes more picky in terms of in terms of looking for job or in terms of accepting of accepting um, job offers. So that is going to put some upward pressure on wage. Or in other words, wage must adjust upward to make sure the business can find ideal candidate. Right? But this increase in wage is going to lead to a negative supply shock. Negative supply shock. Right? And then the economy is going to respond by decrease aggregate supply. Here we go to here. Okay, so this is after a positive demand shock. You can see after a positive demand shock, so the price will increase, right? Uh, so essentially the economy adjusts two steps, right? From here to here and then to here. Okay. And this adjustment can be lengthy. And uh, through this adjustment, you can see the economy is going to fluctuate. This fluctuation are in terms of output fluctuate, output increase and then decline. Right? Labor market uh, fluctuate, unemployment decline, but eventually it's going to increase. And this increase is coming from the decline in aggregate supply. Right, and the wage you're going to see so increase and eventually decline, right? And the price increase. Right? So these fluctuation are not ideal or not desirable for for the aggregate economy. Right? So that is that is the rational behind why we want government intervention. Okay. And in the next module, we will explain how government can help stabilize the economy. But this is a positive dimension. Now I can run the entire process by looking at a negative demand shock. If it's a negative demand shock and the aggregate demand shift to the left, so now we are here. So you can see we produce less than we potentially can produce. So we are in a recession, right? So this is a recessionary gap. And in this recessionary gap, price decline. So this is called deflation, right? So this is the initial response. But again, so short record supply stay the same line. But now because of this decline price, and because of this sticky wage, what happened? So that is going to this high unemployment. Right? Because the profit margin of the business, business will decline. Wage is the same, but so they make the sale uh, less for the good they produce. Right? So they have lower profit margin. So this high unemployment eventually is going to bring us down wage. Okay? And why the wage will go down? 
is because the high unemployment so make the workers less picky. And people are willing to work for lower wage because lower wage is better than zero wage. All right. Okay, so this negative, this, sorry, this declining wage leads to a positive shock to supply. Right? And then so you can see the supply curve will shift to the right because of wage decline. So now we are here. Okay. So eventually we settle in the new long run equilibrium after the economy adjusts. Right? So you can see we move from this point to here and to here. And similarly, you can see, so there's a fluctuation price. Price keep declining, right? And a fluctuation uh, output, output decline, and then the re, uh, rebound. And then the unemployment, unemployment increase and the decline. And the wage, so similarly wage, so is going to uh, stay the same and then decline. Right? So you can see those are the fluctuation. That those are the reason why we may want some stabilization policy from the government. Right? So again, so in the next module, so once we introduce government, once we start to look at physical policy, we will understand how physical policy can help the economy. So here I can give you a flavor how the physical policy can, can help the economy, right? So just use the example, say if there's a negative demand shock, we are here. Right? So with the negative demand shock, we are here. And without a corporate intervention, we are going to wait the wage to adjust. So we are going to wait the wage to decline so that lift up aggregate supply. Right? So this is without a government intervention. But maybe we can do something else. Because remember AD. AD is aggregate expenditure. So far we simplify it. We say aggregate expenditure comes from C and I. But actually aggregate expenditure includes what? Includes G. And includes net export. Right? So for the government, one thing the government immediately can do is they can adjust G. Just imagine if G increase, I'm gonna to explain to you so how the government can increase G and then to, um, uh, to what extent and in which form, okay? Now let's say the government can somehow manage to increase G. So that immediately implies so the aggregate demand curve will shift back, right? Because again, so this is going to give out aggregate demand. You may observe C decline, Y is decline, but now, so if the government can increase spending, so that's going to, that's going to lift up aggregate demand. So now, instead of waiting the labor market adjust, by lowering the wage and the leave of aggregate supply. And so we end up with here. So this is what could happen if let economists adjust, right? So we may go to another route. So first there's a negative demand shock. We go to from, e, from here to here. Now immediately the government increased spending. So we are going to immediately return to here without going through this lengthy adjustment process and without lowering the wage. Now, you may wonder, so how the government can do that? So the, the, the fact is, or the truth is, so the government can carry out large scale spending. So for example, so the government can renovate highway system. Just think about the new deals back in 1930s. Or the government can spend in uh, new energy. Right? Or the government can spend in higher education. Or the government can spend in uh, improving um, public health. Like the, to finance the development of vaccine that, that is fight for corona, coronavirus. 
right? So this is how government spending can help the economy. Right? But certainly there's a caveat or there's a catch. Right? So the government spending, but where does government spending, uh, sorry, where does the financing of the government funding come in from? Right? In a sense, where does the resource come in from? Okay? And then later you're gonna see, so either the government can pay for the increase in spending through tax or through debt. But so clearly, so both tax and debt, so they are gonna have a negative impact on the economy, but maybe in different magnitude or in different timing. But that's what we are gonna discuss after this module. Okay, so let me erase everything. So essentially here, so what we really need to understand is uh, what, what happens if we, if the economy receives a shock to demand? Okay, so we focus on demand side is because I explained to you the four possible shocks to the economy. And we find out, so the pattern of data suggests most of the trouble is caused by demand. But again, that doesn't mean so supply shock is not important. But as a matter of fact, supply shock is, is worse. Now, as I just showed you earlier, if there's a negative, negative supply shock, we are entering stagflation. And this stagflation imposes a dilemma for the policy makers. Right? So if they want to lift up the output, and then they are going to lead to further inflation. If they want to st stabilize the price, and then they are going to see the even deeper um, slump or even bigger drop in output. Right? But okay, for this class, we are going to. Um, being very light on that part. So make sure you understand the, the, the impact of demand shock and how the economies respond to demand shock. That'd be good. All right, uh, thank you so much for your attention. So just make sure um, uh, you come for the next class so we are gonna have a review for our midterm three. Thank you.